Someone please give me a good reason not to buy more Palantir stock because I'm already in heavy and I'm about to invest some more. Just based on all this research that I've been doing, I've spent so many hours of my Saturday digging into Palantir on top of my massive amount of due diligence I've already done. And this, the more I dig into this, the more I just want to buy and hold additional shares of this company. I already own 1,600 shares. I just want to buy and hold more. So Palantir recently saw a price dip you know, from some highs last week down just a couple dollars per share. You know, I was up like 20% 20, 20 on my current holdings and now I'm up like 8%. And with that dip in price, I wanted to do some additional research, see hey, maybe do I wanna add some additional shares? What, what exactly should I do here? So in my research, I actually watched a video by Tom Nash that was really good on Palantir being a potential $1 trillion company. I recommend checking out that video. If you're interested in Palantir, you probably are if you're watching this video. But anyways, this got me to thinking, is this actually feasible? Could this actually be a trillion dollar company? I mean, it's a 40 some billion dollar company right now. It's valued high right now. So what would it take to be a trillion dollar company? And I've really been digging into this and I think it's possible. I think it's very possible and for several reasons. So let me just go ahead and break down these reasons because I've been literally watching like interviews that are 12 years old from, from Alex Karp on the Charlie Rose show and just like everything I can possibly digest about this company. So there's a lot of factors here that come into play. So let's just break them down one by one. And I think the, the most important, important factor is what is Palantir's moat? Do they have a moat? What is the, the barrier to become the next Palantir? Because really there isn't anyone like them right now. So could a Google or an Amazon just just make a service like theirs and then directly compete and then potentially take away from Palantir? Or are they are they just per, so fortified and protected? So just as a brief overview with Palantir, they're a 17-year-old company and they spent three years with zero revenue. No money coming in just while they're building their product. And that's after they already had a prototype built. And that was after a proof of concept at PayPal. This entire concept was developed at PayPal where they, where they basically made this human machine combined interface to help fight fraud as they were losing a ton of money at PayPal. So they took that good idea, built a prototype, and then spent years building that out before anything was ever sold to a customer. Now, even at this point, 17 years in, they only have 125 customers. Now, these customers are massive, and each contract is multiple of millions of dollars, and each of those cu customers are spending about 30% more each year. So 125 customers means a lot, but that is a lot of work to get to where we're at right now. And this isn't even counting the fact that this is basically a government-backed comp company at this point. So by 2013, which would be about 10 years after they started, they, they say that they started in 2004, but the actual filings were in 2003. So about 10 years after they started, Palantir was already in contracts with at least 12 different governmental organizations. So let me just list those off real quick so, so you can see who is sending them money and trusting them and continuing to do so because these people don't get contracts and then fire Palantir and choose someone else. Everyone gets these contracts and then Palantir just has their grips around them and they just spend more money. So we have the CIA, the DHS, the NSA, the FBI, the CDC, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, the Special Operations Command, West Point, Joint IED Defeat Organization and the Allies, the Recovery, Accountability and Transparency Board, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. That was all by 2013. That doesn't even count the army, which was their biggest contract debate to date. So by 2013, they already had at least $1.2 billion in contracts just from government entities. Now, this kind of information is pretty hard to find because they weren't a public company at, at that point, And it's a little bit fuzzy, you know, as to who their customers were, what exactly the money, you know, coming in was, but at least $1.2 billion by 2013. So they're just building this fortified castle over all this time. They had, they had competitors who were saying, ah, they're just the, the fancy, you know, new tech guy, the Silicon Valley guys on the block. They're not going to last. Well, here they are lasting and basically every government agency is like, we can't live without them at, at this point. So I'm just not sure that it's possible for a Google or an Amazon to directly compete with them. I mean, let's say Google, because that'd probably be the most likely potential uh, competitor to, to, you know, to beat them. 
it's not really just a money issue. I think it's more a time issue too. So I think if Google were to directly compete, they probably need five to seven years and 10 to $20 billion to do so. And also we have to remember that Palantir is doing just this, where Google does hundreds of different things. So, you know, they wouldn't be banking on that one thing to be successful. As of right now, I just don't see any kind of direct competitor happening anytime soon. So on top of this, digging that moat even further, they have tons of government connections. Now they were a little, a little bit resistant to government connections at first when they were newbies on the block, but I think they learned pretty quickly. Now they do say that they don't spend any money on advertising. However, I think that that's a little bit of uh, a white lie. Yes, they don't have like a line item for advertising expenses, but they do spend money on lobbying and the you know US government is a huge customer of theirs and that's kind of like advertising for the US government. But they do spend much, much less than most government contractors do. So they spend just over a million bucks on lobbying, at least in the year that I was looking at. And some of their direct competitors are spending as much as 15 times more than that. But yet Palantir is getting more contracts, being the new guys on the block. But on top of this, they have some, some hard hitters on their lobbying boards. Former Senator John Beru, former Senator Trent Lott, Marine Brigadier General Terry Paul, and they also have just tons of other friends in extremely high places as well that just sing Palantir's praise, like to a degree that it almost doesn't make sense why these people would would go out on a limb so much to sing these praises. So th this list includes the former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, former CIA Director David Petraeus, former Director of Central Intelligence George Tenet, and also both Condoleezza Rice and George Tenet are advisors to Palantir, and Petraeus considers himself a close friend of Alex Karp. So we have some tight-knit people here. And then on top of this, Forbes actually interviewed those three on Alex Karp. They literally interviewed Condoleezza Rice, the former director of the CIA and the director of the Central Intelligence on basically how much they like Alex Karp. It's, it's insane, actually. On top of this, just furthering, furthering the depth of their moat, um, something I think that they do a really good job of is they are extremely aggressive. I found a quote in, a, in an article from years back, like when they were just a small company valued at less than a billion dollars. A Washington aide said this, it was, quote, Palantir is a company that couldn't win a contract and now doesn't want another company to win. It happens all the time. They're just being more aggressive about it than normal. On top of this aggressiveness factor, a little fun fact you might be interested in, Palantir also sued the army and won. This company sued the army and won and then got an 800 million dollar contract from them. They sued them because they said that their bidding process was unfair and it wasn't welcoming to newcomers. Won the lawsuit, got a contract, their biggest contract to date. You have to admire the aggressiveness here. There is a problem with Palantir though that I want to bring up. They are bad at showing and explaining what exactly they do. I mean, if you look at their demos, they're scripted, they're awkward, they don't tell a story, they don't invoke emotion, they don't do a good job of exciting you that much unless you're willing to really sit and break down the technical language and break it down piece by piece and try to think, you know, as if you're the owner of a business or managing some team on the ground in, in some war-torn country. They do a very bad job of building excitement out of an inherently very exciting thing. So I've spent, at least at this point, 15 hours digging into all things Palantir. Because of that, you also should probably go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe, and maybe even consider using the link down below to grab a couple free stocks with Weeble. You'll get two free stocks, I'll get a free stock, and you'll be helping out this channel. Either way, I spend a lot of time digging into all things Palantir and I've really been trying to think, okay, what's the most simple way I can explain what they do? And I've come up with this. You have to think of Palantir as selling the shovel. They are selling the tool to make the lives easier of other organizations. So think of it this way. Let's say you, you dig holes for a living and on, in a typical day you can dig 10 holes. Someone comes to you and says, hey, if you pay us 100 bucks, 
we'll sell you a shovel that you can, you can now dig 20 holes in one day. You don't have to change anything else. That's basically what Palantir does in the most simplistic way. The most simplistic way to break down an extremely complicated company. Now, a lot of people just say they are an AI company and that's not really accurate. It's actually the opposite. It's IA, which is intelligence augmentation, which is a concept that's been around since 1956 when it was introduced for the first time in the book called An Introduction to Cybernetics. Basically what intelligence aug augmentation is, is any device or tool that adds to the intelligence of the human user. Like an abacus is an example of this. Your, your phone is, a, is an example of this. The internet is an example. You know, it's amplifying the intelligence of the user. It's not just a machine doing everything. It's AI, a, a, a easy to use interface, flagging systems, data grabbing systems that present themselves to a human reviewer who can then make the final decision, input that decision, and then the system becomes smarter and smarter. Let's do a couple examples here. The most simple example is an example of a bank customer. Let's say someone comes into your, your local bank and you know has a couple questions about getting a new credit card. They're an existing customer. They've been a customer for 15 years. Well, they sit down, you say, oh, you know, come on, sit down. We'll 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 discuss the new the new card options for you. You pull up their uh, their name on your little customer database, your your Palantir customer database, and on here it gives you a timeline of every single interaction your bank has ever had with this customer. Every complaint they've had, every overdraft fee they've had, every product that they've showed interest in, every advert that they took action on is right there. You can, you're able to see everything right there. Now, this isn't, this isn't necessarily revolutionary. The data is already there. The, the company has all this data. But then what the system does, it will suggest offers based on AI and running these thousands of cause and effect scenarios to present you a couple offers that the system thinks would be the best to offer that customer based on all this back end. And then once you offer that, whether they agree or say no or whatever the answer is, you input that back, in, back into the system and then the system becomes smarter. Doing another example, because this is a very defense-based company, I found an actual video on YouTube that showed how Palantir discovered illicit ivory trading and the steps that it took to find that. So this is how it worked. There was a shipping container that was seized and it contained illegal ivory. Now that shipping container said that it contained recycled waste. Obviously it didn't contain re recycled waste, but the Palantir system automatically flagged two other shipments going to the same port that also said recycled waste. Well, those shipments, also contained illegal ivory. But then what Palantir does is it was automatically able to pull addresses, phone numbers, emails, entities, and people associated with these shipments. It even, it even went as far as showing a company that was affiliated with the, with the shipment and then their income statements and who had been paying that company to show relations. And this led to associated properties, associated entities, based, you took an address and said, hey, this entity has this same address, check into that entity. It found that it had a similar owner and they were able to find who was shipping this illicit ivory. So it's, it's taking information that is available, that's available to, to these entities or you know, to the government, to whoever, but it's making the decisions much, much more quick instead of someone having to sit and hope for insights, looking at 10 different information sources. And that's what I think is the most exciting about all of this. Now to the, the potential size of this company, the potential $1 trillion market cap, which would be a 25X of where we're sitting right now. I wouldn't mind a 25X of where we're sitting right now. That would, that would make me t very rich just off of this one stock with my current position. But we have to think about what industry they're in. And that's hard to answer. They're in kind of so many inter industries working with businesses of all size, you know, mostly large businesses, but they're focusing on working with smaller and smaller businesses, massive governments. They work with fraud. They work with, you know, making sure your local bank's advertisement program is as successful as possible. They work with finding malware on the Dalai Lama's computer, like so many different things because they have this shovel that can just be plopped down on existing data. And then boom, everything is smarter. They have their grips around it and you really can't 
can't not use them. But we can think in terms of industries. Okay, the defense industry, that's at at least $800 billion industry. The CRM industry, that's at least a $40 billion industry. The AI industry, that has projections of around $700 billion in the next five to seven years. So all these industries, and if they really only need a few percentages of each of these industries to potentially be that trillion dollar company. And I think it's possible. But I have to say, this is not a short-term investment. This is not the kind of thing that I think you, you're gonna be able to stomach if you're hopping in short-term. Of course, none of this is financial advice, none of it. But if you're hopping in a short-term, there's going to be ups and downs, and there's probably not gonna be the performance that you're looking for for a short-term thing. But if you're willing to bet five to 10 years out, I think you're going to be rewarded handsomely from this. All in all, I just think it's totally possible that this could be a trillion dollar company. It's insane to think of, but I think I might have to buy more.